Hey, y'all. Big, ambitious projects take time. Lots of it. Ask a builder to ballpark the hours required, and you'll get a pretty consistent answer. It depends. You might be surprised to learn that I'm frequently asked, hey, how much longer will it take you to finish the charger? After many inquiries, I have refined my answer and settled on the polite phrase, as long as I need. See, the Willamette Charger Project is as much an exercise in skill building as it is about building a car. I'm trying to build at my highest level of quality, and since I'm no pro, I compensate by applying a judicious quantity of hours and never settle for good enough. It's a struggle sometimes, but I'm a guy that delights in achieving goals doing my best work and making continued steady progress. To that end, we're going to make some deep cuts into the car this time, and it's gonna hurt. But before we get rolling, let's do a quick bit of catch up. On the last episode, it was all about prep and design. I measured the original chassis dimensions in preparation for building a new frame and built a structure to which the unibody would secure. I call it the birdcage. We're picking back up at about that point, though I've done a bit of work in the interim. The birdcage is all burned in and tied to the frame table, and I threw in a bit more bracing inside the car to help it keep its shape. Using the careful application of heat, I slowly removed the factory lead filler from the sail pillars. And hey, just a quick safety item here, always wear your full PPE when working with lead. There are no safe levels of lead, and once it's in your body, you really can't get it out. From there, the trashed sheet metal was easily removed. Forensic analysis revealed that there were actually three cars put together to make this one, and it was done badly. Also, and this should be clearly evident by now, but this is not a restoration. I'm building a whole new frame and chassis, and so there is no need to be sentimental about the original panels or rails. Then, it was down to securing the unibody to the birdcage. Remember the plan from last time? Secure the uprights to the unibody bulkheads, basically the A and C pillars. And one bit of detail here. I welded on a fat quarter-inch plate to the 16-gauge unibody to improve the overall strength of the mount. Lastly, and this is where we get current, I threw on a big lateral brace to stiffen up the whole assembly. And with that, the car is locked to the frame table and the unibody shape is secured and safe. Now I can remove the rest of the Rev1 chassis without the car collapsing in on itself, which is what's about to happen. Depending on your perspective, cutting out this earlier design is either a testament to an uncompromising commitment to quality or a huge mistake. Got to hit your heart. 
You might think, but you were so far along, why change now? Well, being deep into the wrong plan is still the wrong plan. Fortunately, the math was simple. I was building something that was too heavy and would rather start over than give in to the inertial force of something I knew wasn't my very best work. A second drafting would yield a one-piece frame that was stiffer, stronger, and much more weight efficient. If I had to break this into two kind of ideas, two tasks, it'd be first that we separate the unibody from the frame. Then it would be that we remove the frame, and then we can have a beer. If you want a change. In between, we're gonna take great care to not disturb the parts of the unibody that we wanna have you know, relatively intact and uh, that need to maintain a dimension. So I'll reiterate, there's only two tools we're, to we're using. Uh, one is a disc grinder, very smooth cutting uh, device. Second is a plasma cutter. Again, no vibration introduced. We're only gonna to move to blade type tools um, if I need to really just kind of get through one little spot and I'll use an air saw, which is a very, very fine moving blade. I guess what I'm getting at is no sawzalls. No sawzalls. No sawzalls. Not yet. Don't get me wrong. It took a minute to come around to that understanding. And there was plenty of debate before I grabbed the plasma and got to it. But I'll reference a friend of mine who has a great perspective on building junk more than once. See, Greg is all about the build process and isn't afraid to make a few versions of a system before settling on the final rendering. Got to sing your soul. As he would put it, those early versions are just tuition. Got to sing your soul. Embracing that mantra, I created a big old tuition pile. If you wanna fly, gotta let it go. If you wanna fly, there ain't nobody gonna do it for you. Got to find your own. needed quite a bit of additional cleanup to remove about 100 tack welds and the last vestiges of the Rev-1 rocker plating. Here's a look at uh, some inner rocker pieces, and I think they adequately describe what I've maybe struggled to verbalize with y'all up to this point. Um, that is some of the kind of the design failures and the construction failures of my original uh, chassis. Uh, it's just too heavy. Um, I put too much of what I had learned building my diesel Suburban into this car. And, it, and you know, I thought I was being light by using eighth inch and it was all still strong. Um, but that a little bit thinner and really what I needed to be thinking about and what I've moved to in the second revision is Using more stuff like dimpled 14 gauge That's where my brain needs to be in order to build this so between rev 1 and, and rev 2 that I'm building now uh, I've learned and continued to refine a design that is more weight efficient just as structural um, and, and then a lot a lot lighter. So that's what I mean by weight efficient so these are going in the scrap bin, but I wanted to show y'all, um, you know, the, the tank, a little cross section of the tank before these things went in the bin. All right. So back to work.
It took two days to clean up the rest of the unibody, mostly the rockers, before I could get a clean set of measurements for the inner rocker plating. I still had the dimensions from the Rev1 design in my notebook, but wanted to check again before drawing up the new inner rocker plates and sending that design off to the laser shop. Through this cleanup, I reset the whole outer rocker back to the original upper pinch weld and sectioned the lower portion of the rocker to match. Basically, the inner plate needed to be perfectly vertical. That design for the inner rocker plate has had a few versions, not surprisingly. The factory rocker shape has three distinct profiles, and I've measured, sketched, and eventually drawn those in Bentec so my local laser shop could cut and bend them to my specification. Rather than make it all from scratch and burn a day doing basic cutting, bending, and drilling, lots of drilling. I tend to outsource stuff like this so I can continue to make meaningful progress back at the shop. One of the things that I've started to do more of is instead of fabricating every single part on my car or even the truck from scratch, is I've started designing them in Bentec, which Bentec, SolidWorks, whatever you've kind of got access to, they're all they're all uh, pretty decently flexible. Uh, I use Bentec because it's kind of like an entry-level software, and that suits me really well. But I like to you know draw and design things, and then send them out uh, for maybe some pre-work, some pre-assembly. And that's exactly what I've done here with these sheet metal parts that are going to become the inner rocker plating. Rather than getting a piece, breaking it, drilling what I think I counted is uh, 57 different holes, I sent that all to the laser shop. They lasered it out and then uh, you know put it on a brake, actually on a press brake, to get at the exact 94 degrees that I measured on my rockers. And uh, I'm going to be able to go pick those parts up today and save myself a whole bunch of time not having to create all that stuff from uh, truly from scratch. I can uh, skip ahead to just assembly. To me, it's just a good use of time. And that's the most precious commodity for a project like this. One of the best parts of the metal fabrication and gearhead community are the people you meet in it. My buddy, David Demois, runs his own fab business and has acquired several large tools that us regular folk aspire to have in our own shops. Yeah, which way are we doing? Yeah. One such tool is the iron worker, which made fast work of the inner rocker dimples, leaving plenty of time for chit chat and all around BSing. You'll see more of David and some other really good folks in future episodes. Go, go ahead, go ahead, put your Arnold on it. Yeah, that's plenty yeah. strong. Even in this direction, which is easier, that's yeah. solid. When I got the charger in 2013, I absolutely knew I was getting into a big project, at least compared to the work I'd done on the Suburban. But at the time, I wouldn't have guessed the level to which I would later be willing to take it. My courage, or stupidity, depending on who you ask, came in increments. See, back then, I saw frame-up builds with a bunch of one-off details as something well out of my league. The kind of projects only pro builders with their names on the outside of a building could do. What I've learned, 
and I guess what I'm working to show in this series, is that with enough time and guidance from those with some experience, regular folk like us can come up with some pretty slick stuff. This is the first episode of 2020, and I've got a lot planned for the year. The Charger's frame and suspension is getting built out, and we'll get married back to the unibody at some point. So that means engine mounts, a trans mount, cross members, a trans tunnel, headers and exhaust, and I'll even get around to installing the chassis works front and rear suspensions. And let's not forget about the Suburban, my first automotive love. There are a couple of large trips planned for the second half of the year, and we're going to make some significant changes to the suspension and braking. If you want to keep up between episodes, you can find me on Instagram, Willamette Motor and Fab. I post all my current progress there, and you'll get an inside look at what's coming up. If you like this type of fabrication content, be sure to like and subscribe. And in fact, join the conversation by leaving a, a comment below. Those three things really help to support the channel and, and make it uh, continue to grow. So in the meantime, we're going to the sheet metal shop. We're going to get parts. We're going to have a good time putting stuff together this weekend. Thanks for watching. We've got a big year ahead. I'm glad you're here to be a part of it. Thank y'all. And until next time, take care. We're still here. The episode's over. You, you've got, got to go back to work. It's over. Go, go back to work. See you.